Antibiotic resistance is emerging. It's a huge problem. There's estimated 1.27 million people that died of antibiotic resistant infections in 2019. In the last four years, more people have died of antibiotic resistant bacterial infections than COVID. So why aren't more people talking about it? And why are we having a hard time getting people engaged in the issue of antimicrobial resistance? I really think that antibiotic resistance is a microbial problem, and therefore I think the solutions lie with microbiologists. And I think we need to change the way we talk about it and the way we think about it and use microbes to help us combat antibiotic resistance. So I'm a big fan of antibiotics. Penicillin, um, I think, is, is a great drug. It's one of the biggest discoveries, I think, in, um, that's come to humans in the last 100 years. And that discovery, we know that the reduction of infectious disease dropped over 70% because of antibiotics in, since 1942. So why is it that um, we're struggling and we're losing these drugs? Well, I think it's some of the way that we think about it. Another thing that's really important to um, antibiotic resistance is that antibiotics came at a time when we really started developing ClinMicro. And so as microbiologists, when we talk about clinical microbiology, really what we're doing is we're naming pathogens. And so the average person really only knows the name of bacterial pathogens. People don't know about beneficial bugs like lactococcus because we don't talk that much about lactococcus, but you know, your friend who has a urinary tract infection knows the name of E. coli, which causes a ton of infectious diseases. And so all humans really know and the lay public knows about microbes is pathogens. And what's the result of that? Well, the result is, is that we walk around terrified that microbes are going to get us with every turn. Evidence of this is, People are happier with their doctor if they actually get an antibiotic when they see their doctor. We spent the early 2000s into 2020 having antibacterial soap everywhere we went because we wanted to stamp them out. And I would just challenge you that if you drop your cookie on the floor, that you, the terror that then goes to your heart because you're afraid that some terrible microbe's going to jump on it and kill you if you don't obe you know, like obey the three second rule, um, that we're all pretty paranoid about the microbes that are out to get us. But I want to remind everybody that about 99.9% .9 of microbes on this planet are here to help humans, have evolved with us, or at least don't give a lick about humans and aren't pathogens. I think we need to really, really highlight how beneficial microbes could be. Because the downside is, is when we wipe out microbes, antibiotic resistant bacteria can go into their place and actually Protecting microbiomes protect us from antibiotic resistance. As somebody who is a prescriber and a, somebody who practices an infectious disease and does stewardship, I can just tell you that if somebody comes into my emergency department with sepsis or some type of bacterial infection, current state, I don't know what it is. So I'm going to prescribe a very broad spectrum antibiotic. Let's take Piptazo, which is one of the most commonly prescribed antibiotics in the hospital. That antibiotic kills pseudomonas, most gram-negatives, strep, staph, anaerobes. And what's the consequence of that? Well, we don't talk that much about the consequence of that. Um, it doesn't cover MRSA, and so why not? Let's throw on some vancomycin to make sure we get that too. And so we'll leave that patient on Piperacillin, Tazobactam, and vancomycin for several days. Sometimes we can remove the vanc because of rapid diagnostics. And we wait until we've got better diagnostics to tell us what exactly the, the infection is going to be. Well, what's the sort of downside of that? I equate this to sort of using a bomb, right? If somebody's after you in the woods as a sniper, the pathogen, let's say it's group A strep in the, in the scenario that we've got this person with sepsis in our emergency department, but we give piptazo and vancomycin when all they had was strep pyogenes. Well, the, the equivalent of Piptazo is, you know, the, the, the sniper's out to get you, but you drop a gigantic bomb on the whole area and wipe out the birds, the bunnies that were there, the trees, the plants. You get the sniper too, but the difference here is what quickly repopulates that are things that 
aren't susceptible or killed off by piptazo, things like yeast or drug resistant antibody, you know, bacteria that are resistant to um, piptazo, for example. There was a recent study that was really nice out of Michigan that showed that in patients that were admitted with critical illness that actually got anti-anaerobic therapy had a worse outcome during that hospitalization and a higher mortality. Most of that was driven by the fact that when they got anti-anaerobic therapy, they went on to get subsequent enterobacterialis cause ventilator-associated pneumonia down the line. And so what we're doing by giving anti-anaerobic therapy, presumably those anaerobes were there protecting us from colonization with drug-resistant pathogens. So if we can decrease the collateral damage that comes from using broad-spectrum antibiotics, I think we would be better off. And I think we need to change the way that we think about antibiotics. One of the other things that came out of the antibiotic resistance retreat was also some of the other consequences of collateral damage from antimicrobials. Marty Blazer gave an amazing talk, and for those who don't know him, please, uh, he's, he's incredible. Um, but showing really the links in human health when we lose our microbiome. So we've now pretty conclusively linked obesity to dysregulation and microbiome. Cancer is increasingly being linked to changes in microbiome, asthma, diabetes. And if we can link these chronic problems to antimicrobials, maybe we can rethink the way that we protect and become stewards of the microbes that are here to help us and stop trying to stamp them out. I would also highlight, and one of the other things that came out of our retreat was Erica Hartman talking about disinfectant use and how widespread triclosan use in the 70s and 80s, it's now not allowed in soap in the United States. That's not true in all countries. But since 2017, the EPA and FDA have pulled it. Um, but that before that time, 75% of Americans had triclosan detectable in their urine, right? So we are just spraying the planet in an attempt to kill these microbes, yet they're probably here to help us live healthier. And I do think, again, Americans, we just remind them that obesity might be linked to microbiome. That's probably the, the best way to get people to stop overusing antibiotics. Anyway, <laughs> so I think one of the things that came out of the retreat for me was rethinking the way we talk about microbes generally. We've got a society of microbiologists who understand many of these microbes much better than I ever will and how are those microbes healthy, helping us live a healthy life? So, okay, fine. What do I think it would look like if we could increase the awareness of um, the benefits of microbes? I think there would be less prescribing of antimicrobials. I think that would occur because, you know, when you're trying to decide, should I give you an antibiotic or not? I'm not really sure you have an infection. A lot of times, the chip falls on, well, like, why not? I mean, as a physician, I see this all the time as a director of stewardship for the last 15 years. You know, people are like, well, just in case, let's give you the antibiotic. But I think if there was more of a recognition of the downside to human health, to selection for resistance, maybe people wouldn't be as demanding for antibiotics and maybe physicians would be less likely to even prescribe them. I think, um, leaking antibiotics to unnecessary disinfectants and rethinking the disinfectants that we're using that are probably affecting the environmental microbes and how those then get back to promote resistance in our world. And then also I think we need to really think about animal health. So Paul Plummer spoke on um, antibiotic use in veterinary medicine and how we need to work together. Unfortunately, in animal health, they don't have a lot of diagnostics. So if one cow gets sick and needs antibiotics, they basically can't spend the money or the time and don't have access to diagnostics. So they have to treat the entire herd with antimicrobials. And I think we can do better than that. And I think we would if we had public pressure of the recognition of how bad antibiotics can be for all these different reasons. So what do we need to do? So I have a call to action for everybody. I think number one is microbiologists, we need to continue to work in the clin micro space to get better diagnostics. If, you know, if I've got somebody that I have to guess that I need to give anti-anaerobic therapy to, and actually they had a group A strep infection, which should be more targeted, I need to know that sooner. 
we do have some incredible rapid diagnostics. I think a strep throat test that happens at a clinic is a great example of one. It's negative, you don't even get antibiotics. It's positive, you get penicillin, which is a targeted antibiotic. It's not, it's like a bomb too, but it, we can't fix that. So, um, but you get a more targeted antibiotic. And so finding places where we can do rapid diagnostics, and there are a lot of really smart per people working really hard on doing that. Also, we need to develop drugs differently. Antibiotic have been developed so that you have a very broad spectrum antibiotic so everybody will use it because traditionally we have sold antibiotics as a commodity. You know, the more you sell, the more money a drug company makes, but we need to change that balance and think about targeted treatments for infectious disease, such as fidaxomycin and C. diff. That's a good pairing of C. diff is the organism that's causing the disease, Fidaxomycin is fairly targeted, not completely, to Clostridioides difficile. Another antibiotic that's come to market recently is Sulbactam Durlobactam. It really targets just Acinetobacter, but again, we don't have diagnostics to even get that used, used up front quickly. But sort of, how are we going to think about diagnostics for Acinetobacter so that we can get patients to that exact drug that they need quicker? And we need to continue, you know, I implore the community of microbiologists to continue to work to understand the collateral damage of antibiotic use, disinfectant use on microbes and start naming and recognizing the microbes that are helping us live and protecting us from antibiotic resistant pathogens. And lastly, I look forward to a future where microbiologists figure out what microbes are really critical and protecting us from human diseases. And are there ways to give therapeutics that restore human health and gut health and protect us from drug resistant pathogens. And so I implore you all to go out and become stewards of microbes um, rather than stewards of antibiotics so that we can really protect um, and improve human health and reduce antibiotic resistance. Thank you so much.